Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 233 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobolski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. As far as medieval animals go, it's pretty hard to beat my personal favorite, Walt Disney's Robin Hood. There could be no better animal to capture the trickster nature of the world's most endearing outlaw, which just goes to show how enduring the trickster-fox connection is. Medieval people would likely have cast that movie exactly the same way. If you remember back to my conversation with Anne Louise Avery about the super popular trickster fox of the Middle Ages, Renard, you may recall that he was the original idea behind those animated characters before the Robin Hood story took over as a bit more audience-friendly for the 20th century. Foxes were everywhere in the medieval world and in the medieval imagination. But was their image as simple as Renard and Robin would have us believe? And where do the ideas that we have about foxes come from? This week, I spoke with Dr. Paul Walkers about the medieval fox. Paul is Professor Emeritus for Historical Dutch Literature to 1500 at the University of Utrecht and the Honorary President of the International Renard Society. He's written countless articles in English and Dutch on medieval fox tales, animal fables, and how the stories of Renard entertained and educated medieval people. His new book is Introducing the Medieval Fox. Our conversation on why foxes were both loved and hated in the real world, in fables, and in the Christian imagination of the Middle Ages is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Paul, for joining me to talk about medieval foxes. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you for the invitation. Now, I was just asking you, and I wanted to get this on the recording, where do you think people would find medieval foxes? Because you had to look a little bit carefully into this, right? Where yeah. would people find medieval foxes? Yeah. In the book, I have made a distinction in three parts of, of the landscape. The part where humans live, the ordered region around cities and around villages and farms, and then the wilderness, which was the biggest part of Europe in that time because they were far fewer people than uh, nowadays. And in the wilderness, I say there is a part that is linked to the place where people live and where people come uh, fairly regularly. And there are places where humans are absent, the -hmm. deep wilderness and the near wilderness. And it seems clear from the material that we can find that you find foxes in the near wilderness. And they come to the farms, uh, not to the cities, I think, but they come to the farms. And one of the things you read in in all medieval sources is that they are a pest, that they are vermin because they like to eat fowl, uh, especially chickens and and geese. And that is important food for farmers. So when you are a medieval farmer and you have two or three chickens and the fox comes in and grabs one, You are very angry and very sad. (laughs) And what archaeologists say about where they find the the bones of foxes, and when you read about very old place names, then you see that that conforms to what you suppose. In the places where humans live, there you find fox bones, and there you find names that say, this is the hill of the foxes. That is the place where foxes live in, in a den and so on. And when you read the hunting manuals, you get the same information. So I think you can say for, for modern times that foxes live in cities, not mostly, but often. That was not true in the Middle Ages, but in the Middle Ages, uh, there were no, near enough human beings for them to be visible and known. Yes, absolutely. And disliked. (laughs) (laughs) And disliked. So you were mentioning hunting manuals. And hunting manuals are, as you say in the book, they are mostly aimed at nobility. But we know that farmers are trapping foxes too. So can you tell us a little bit about how people are trapping foxes, both the nobility and the peasantry? Yes. What you must do first is discover where they live. So you must try to find the fox dens. And then you should look for entrances and places where they can go out. And in one way or another, you have to close as much of them as possible and then drive them out. 
And there are two ways to drive them out. And one is sending in a small, very fierce dog that hunts them. And then you wait in the last place where the foxes can get out. And when they get out, you hit them with something very heavy. (laughs) Or you have a net and, and catch them in the net and kill them afterwards, which is preferable because then you can use the fur. And the other way, and that is advised in the hunting manuals, is using a sulfurous damp. So make a a fire and and create smoke and put something in it that is slightly poisonous for the foxes, and then they come out. And then you kill them. (laughs) Yes. And And, And that is the way that farmers do it. And another way is using traps. But foxes are clever. And some encyclopedias say that they are willing to bite off their own paw when it is caught in a trap and then go on living with three paws. I don't know whether that is true, but it suggests that traps don't work very well when you try to find foxes. You were saying in your your work on the hunting manuals, that the fox's tenacity is one of the things that hunters really admire about them, that they will not give up, right? Yes, that's true. And I suppose that's based on observation. It's clear that the noble fox hunt with dogs and on horses, that I like that very much because it's not an easy hunt. When, When you try to catch a fox, you have to work for it. Mm -hmm. And of course, for sport, that is interesting. Mm -hmm. There are in the manuals and also in some stories, clearly signs that when when a fox is killed, the hunters salute him and admire his ingenuity and his, yeah, the sport he has given them. Okay, nice. Now the next fox. (laughs) Because the the, the humans want to win, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's still true. (laughs) <laughs> it's not a good sport if they don't win no, in the no, end. No, no, it's, it's it's still sport, but it's less pleasant when you lose. <laughs> it's true. We talked a little bit about the fact that people are interested in the fox pelts. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about the fur trade when it comes to foxes? Yeah, there are some very big scholarly studies about pelts and the commerce of pelts. And when you then look for information about fox pelts, it's meager in relation to what you can find about pelts of conies and sheep and so on. And also what you can find regarding a mine or sable or so, the very expensive ones. And the image I constructed out of all the data I could find is that there are two levels where fox pelts are used and uh, one is local when you catch a fox kill him then you have a pelt and you can use that and that is done in all uh, layers of society although I had some signals that not every farmer could use fox pelt when you were a farmer and you used fox that was a sign I'm quite well done (laughs) <laughs> but in higher circles, the simple fox pelt is for lining, not for show. And then if you are a duke or a count and you want fox, you want a black fox or a white fox that has to be important. That is a, a serious part of the commerce in pelts, but necessarily these come in, in smaller amounts. Mm -hmm. Because else they wouldn't be rare, and when they wouldn't be rare, they would not be liked by uh, the nobility, because (laughs) they have distinguished themselves by having things that simple people don't have. And it's interesting that there are so many different qualities of fox pelts. And that you have the standard pelt that you can get in uh, France or in Germany, And you have pelts from the Iberian Peninsula, from the Sahara, from the Siberian steppes, from uh, Sweden. And so you you can see that although it is a small commerce, it's part of a, a big network of trading routes in Europe. Yeah. And it's interesting, as you say, that you can get so many different colors Depending yeah. on where the fox is from, you get a different color. Yes. And I'm sure that increases yeah. the prestige quite a lot. Yes, yes, yes. And the rare types, the white fox, the black fox, 
that are really remarkable and, mm-hmm. and that are used for the very high nobility. Yeah. When they can get it. And it's not just the pelts that people are using when it comes to foxes. They're also using other bits of the fox for medicine yes. and other things, right? Yeah. Yes. And that is something that is very difficult to determine what happened exactly because most of the information is found in encyclopedias. And encyclopedias are books that collect knowledge without checking whether it is correct knowledge or not. (laughs) So there is information in encyclopedias that must have been wrong, that people in the Middle Ages who were busy with the practical sides of life would always neglect because they knew that it was wrong. But it was in some old book, so it should be in the encyclopedia. But you find things in encyclopedias about using of fox parts that you also find in medical books. And I think when that combination is there, then you can assume that they indeed used it. Mm -hmm. But there are other animals and other plants that are used far more often. But I found some interesting cases that still in the 16th century, people working down in mines were advised to drink a mix of parts of the lungs of foxes combined with grapes and spices to protect their lungs. So lungs of fox protect the lungs of workers in the mine. And what, of course, is very interesting, they say that when you take the testicles of a fox and make a past of it and you eat that, that it is the equivalent of the modern Viagra. (laughs) And and these things you find. But... (laughs) I think that everything that can be used in the Middle East is used because they have far less possibility than we have, so that they must use far more. I think the pelt is the most important, and for most people, the best fox is a dead fox, because then he cannot steal their birds. (laughs) It's true. And then you can use all of his parts. Well, speaking of foxes that you find in books, you've mentioned that you find them in encyclopedias and you also find them in bestiaries. So what do bestiaries tell us about foxes? They always say that when a fox is hungry, he searches for wet earth and throws himself in it that it seems as if he is covered with blood and then he lays down on his back and pretends to be dead. And then he waits until the birds of prey come and think, oh, that's a nice meal. And then when they sit on him, he grabs one and he has the meal and not they. And that is always interpreted as the devil who catches unwary human beings by offering them worldly pleasures, which are like the flesh of the fox. And you will come in hell when you follow it. And that's the reason why on the cover of my book, you find the fox feigning death and the birds who want to eat him, but will be eaten. (laughs) Yes. And your book, while we're talking about the physical book, this is in the introducing series about animals. I've done a couple of these on the podcast already, and they always have a little flip in the corner where you can make the fox run by flipping the pages. I I need to mention that because it's so cute. (laughs) Yeah. I like the series very much. Mm -hmm. And the four volumes that are now published are all, I think, interesting, well-written. And the choice of animals, I think, is good. And the typography is very nice. Yeah, it's a beautiful. And and the walking or flying animal is an extra. (laughs) Yes, it's a beautiful extra. Okay, coming back around to the actual fox. So you mentioned in the bestiary that... Well, bestiaries always have allegorical meanings for yes. these animals. And you mentioned a few times in this, you have a, an exploration of how the fox is perceived in biblical terms. So the yes. fox is always quite sinful. Can you tell us yes. a little bit about how people perceive the fox in terms of the biblical references that yes. are made to it? Everywhere where they write about foxes, they stress his cunning and his, his ways that deceive other animals or other beings. And in biblical context, that is almost always interpreted, just like in the best theories, that the fox tricks other beings and that he is therefore an allegory of the devil that is always trying to trick human beings. 
And it's not always because the allegorical interpretation of all things is based on all their properties. And it is in principle possible to find a property of the fox that is positive. But uh, mostly in, in biblical context, you find the fox is the devil. Mm-hmm. Or he is a liar or a heretic, or he is the kind of sin that uses trickery and deceit to bring people to do things that they shouldn't do. And this is, I think, important to stress the, the overwhelming majority of remarks on the fox in the Middle Ages, and especially regarding the Bible and religious meanings, is negative. And, and we tend to think that foxes are Naughty but nice. That Walt Disney makes Robin Hood a fox, mm-hmm. shows that for him, foxes can be cuddled and that they can be admired. And there is a certain admiration in some medieval texts about foxes, but the majority of medieval authors say he is bad. So if we read medieval material, we should always think there are Principal view of the fox differs from ours. Mm -hmm. We tend to think foxes are part of nature and nature is good and he is beautiful. And uh, so, okay, uh, nice beast, uh, a nasty beast. (laughs) Yeah, there was one thing that I, I discovered reading your book, and that is the association between foxes and smelling bad, which is not something I had come across, but it's everywhere in the sources, as you found. Yes, yeah. And it's true. That I, I don't know whether you have ever been in the neighborhood of a fox. Not that close. Not, not close enough not to smell them. Not that close. <laughs> okay. I, I've once in my life, and it stinks. It really stinks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's something people would definitely have observed and then written down. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And th- there you see that for them, the fox was far more part of everyday life. While for most modern people who live in cities, a fox is something to see on the the screen or perhaps in a a zoo or so, but um, (laughs) not something that you meet in in the wild (laughs) in free circumstances. Yeah, it's funny that they are everywhere, but they're still pretty shy. You don't see them all that much. Yeah, no, no, that's true. (laughs) So one of the things that you noticed is that foxes are always being referred to as tricksters. So we can come to the stories of Renard in a minute. But one of the things that he does outside of the bestiary where he's playing dead is almost always using speech to become a trickster. So tell us about how he uses speech to trick people. I think the general pattern is that he talks to the animal or the person that he wants to trick and suggest something that that other being wants, while it is not really available. And then he links this thing that the opponent wants with something that he wants done. So in one of the famous stories, a bear comes to him to summon him to uh, the court of the king. And then he said, that's very nice of you to come to my poor house. And I would have come to court if I hadn't had so much stomach hack because I ate that horrible food, uh, honey. <laughs> and then, of course, the beer says, honey, horrible food, give it to me. And I say, all right, come with me. And then they go to a tree in which two wedges stick because the man working with wood wants to split it to make a chest or something out of it. And then Reinhardt says, the honey is here, and the beer takes his paws and his uh, head in, and the fox removes the wedges, and the beer is caught. Or he suggests an accident as something that was planned and then makes by that his opponent afraid, and then he can go away. And... But it is always, he suggests something that is not true, but that his opponent wants to believe. And then he makes it so nice that to get it, the opponent does exactly as the fox asks. <laughs> and he almost always gets out of it. He almost he almost never gets caught in the Renard stories. He he gets no, out of it. No, that's true. That's true. In the older stories, we see a pattern of wished repetition, like Donald Duck stories. <laughs> 
Tom and Jerry is my favorite example. <laughs> and you know, Tom and Jerry have a conflict and they try to do the, their worst to the other. But whatever happens, tomorrow there will be a new story. Mm-hmm. And that is in the oldest stories of, of the fox also. He has a conflict with another animal and it may be that he gets into trouble, but you know tomorrow there will be another story. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, he has to be the victor or when he loses, he must reach his home and be safe to come out for another adventure. Mm-hmm. And in the later stories, in, in the 13th, 14th century, Then he becomes a symbol of all that is bad and dangerous in in politics and the social hierarchy of the world. And then he becomes the force behind the throne and Mm -hmm. that that can manipulate everything that happens and do what he likes. And if you are against him, then you will lose because the king or the pope or whoever will support the fox without realizing that he does so. Yes, one of the stories that you said, I think it's a Flemish story, mentions that the fox is invited by the Pope to the Pope's yeah. palace and he teaches that, the that, cardinals his ways. It is, a, it is a, a story from Flanders, but it is in French. And then indeed he becomes, first he becomes king. And then the Pope invites him to Rome because he wants to know why the fox is so successful as a king. And then he explains to the cardinals how you need to trick everyone you meet. And then since then, they do it all. (laughs) Yes. Ever since, the cardinals have followed the fox's ways. (laughs) But what was interesting, another thing I hadn't realized was that there is an association between foxes, or at least the trickery of foxes, and the mendicant order, so Dominicans and Franciscans. So tell us about that. Yeah. We see that in the 13th century the links between the church and simple people in villages and churches became more intense, more frequent, because the church as a whole had decided that they needed to take a pastoral role for all people. They needed to take that more seriously and that they needed to instruct people more often and instruct them to pray and to confess and to go to mass and to provide for this new education of many people. The mendicant orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans came into existence and people were, yeah, met them often and and then had to listen to their sermons. And so sometimes this was very good. And of course, there were some mendicants that were egotistical or advise some things that people didn't like. So with the growing of their importance, there grew also some negative feelings towards them. And their main business is talking. And when you have an animal that is determined by his facility in in talking and, and lying, then it is understandable that that animal becomes one of the main symbols to explain the bad side of the mendicants that you see in images and in some stories and also in theater. But there we only have traces of it because we cannot go to medieval theater. And the only things we have are descriptions of what was played sometimes in some places. Yeah, although a time machine would be pretty great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would I would very much like to have a time machine available, yeah. Um, <laughs> When when I could come back, I I would not want to live in the Middle Ages forever. Look how it really was. That would be nice. Yes. I have never met a medievalist that actually wants to live at that time. No, no, no. no. We we know too well what is good uh, of our own time. (laughs) It's true. So before I let you go, do you have a favorite Fox story, a favorite Renard story maybe, or a favorite fable from the Middle Ages about the Fox? Yeah. I like the fable of the fiction whose child was stolen by an eagle and uh, then she asked for a child back and the eagle refused and then the fox took fire and started to burn the tree in which the eagle uh, had his nest and then he became so afraid that he gave the child back and then the fire was put out. So here you see cleverness being used to get something that 
deserve to be received. And another one I like is the stork and the fox. And, and the fox says to the stork, come eat with me. And then he has a very low plate on which the food is, and, and he can slobber it up immediately, and the stork can only take one piece of time. So 90% of the food is eaten by the fox. <laughs> and then the stork says, okay, thank you very much. Very nice meal. Come tomorrow to me, then we eat again. And then the stork serves the food in a very high vase, and he can take everything out, and the fox can only look at the outside of the vase and get nothing to eat. And so he gets what he gave. So that's a nice one. And <laughs> regarding, regarding stories, my story is the second Dutch one, Reinhard's Historie, which I characterize in the book as a bestseller. Mm -hmm. Because in early modern times, you find it all over Europe, in all the major languages, even in Latin. And in the Netherlands, there is far more attention for the first fox story. And almost everyone finds it a better story, but I like the second one. <laughs> and, and I don't know, perhaps because I've worked my whole life on it, but it's an intellectual story. It has many scenes that have a hidden meaning and, and you have to reconstruct what is happening and you have to be very attentive to see how funny it is. And, and I like that sort of story where you have to work. <laughs> I, I don't like, well, I do like stories that are easy to follow, but I have a, a, a real lightness for uh, stories in which you have to work as public. And this is one. Like the fox hunt. It's more fun because... Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much for coming on and telling us all about the medieval fox. It's just been great talking to you about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. To find out more about Powell's work, you can visit his faculty page at the University of Utrecht. His new book is Introducing the Medieval Fox. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hey, hey, well, we just got this really fun piece up about what scribes leave at the end of medieval manuscripts. What do they leave? Well, they do these jokes, kind of like little complaints. Hey, you know, it, it was cold today or something like that. And, and there, there's been a lot of this stuff that kind of has already been online, but there's been some recent research by a person working in Eastern European manuscripts, and she found many of them. So there's some great stuff, right? Stuff like, here the text ends, written by hands and not by feet. <laughs> I mean, it's good to spell that out for people. Yeah. I can't imagine trying to use a quill pen with your feet, but I know that there are lots of painters that do it. So there you yeah. go. Going into this, she thought that this would be very unique stuff, like every kind of scribe leaving their own message. But it turns out in a lot of cases, they're actually copying previous statements. So that uh -huh. like one about the hands and not the feet, that, that comes up again and again. Almost 20 times. That is surprising for sure. But there's still a lot of interesting stuff. Like the one scribe says, the scribe should get a beautiful girl as a reward. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. <laughs> that and better I, not I, have been a monk. <laughs> it was probably a monk. <laughs> the best one, I think, is poor is a good word. Drink better. Give me a drink. The best. Nice. So fun stuff. I hope everyone has a chance to read that because there's a lot of good lines in there. Now, we also have a bit more about medieval manuscripts, but this deals with a, a game called Inculinati, which just has been released on all sorts of platforms. It's been kind of around there for a couple of years. It's won awards and stuff like that, but now it's fully out there for everyone to play. And the uh, hook on this is that they actually made use of several medieval manuscripts to get the images of all the beasts and animals that you play with is kind of a strategy game. So if you want to jump into the world of a medieval manuscript, this is your best choice. There you go. If you're a big fan of all that weird stuff that gets drawn in the margins, this is your day. Yes, yes. So uh, that's a bit of fun. And a final piece of news, if you go out metal hunting in the farms of England, you could get rich like a couple of guys did where they found 122 Anglo-Saxon coins. And it just went out for, out for auction and they made 325,000 pounds. <laughs> wow, that's nice. I'd like to do that. Me too. I really want to do that. One coin uh, of Harold Godwinson reached 24,000 pounds on auction. 
a penny of his is worth 24,000 pounds. Wow. Wow. He would be very impressed by that, I think. It might mm -hmm. be his greatest accomplishment as king. <laughs> Sadly, it's so true. Well, thank you, Peter, for stopping by and telling us what is on the website this week. Thanks. Thank you to everyone who supports my work and that of other indie historians through Medievalist.net's Patreon page. Patrons have access to all sorts of awesome stuff like subscriptions to Medieval World magazine, a book club, digital downloads, and ad-free versions of Medievalist.net and this podcast. And now you can even get a digital bundle of my survival guides and my first book, The 5-Minute Medievalist, right on Patreon. To get in on all the action and to support your favorite medievalists, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from foxes to soxes, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or X at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of Chivalry and Courtesy, Medieval Manners for a Modern World, now out in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an amazing day. Yeah.